Hi everybody and welcome to Talk Gnosis. This is the first part of our four-part series on the Gnosis of Gurdjieff with Richard Hodges from the Gurdjieff Foundation. I wanted to uh, give a special thanks to Bishop Lady Peterson for filling in for Jonathan Stewart tonight. Uh, she, uh, she was gracious enough to step in on this topic that she knows a lot about because Jonathan was on assignment, so uh, we are very grateful to have her help. So we will talk about uh, who was G.I. Gurdjieff and what was the system he developed. We talk a little bit about his travels and his spiritual influences. He has an interesting concept of waking sleep, and we talk about that and how doing work in groups is actually very beneficial for his system. So all that and more coming up on this episode of Talk Gnosis, part one of the Gnosis of Gurdjieff with Richard Hodges. So who was a G.I. Gurdjieff? Well, this of course is the question everyone wants to, to start with, but it's really a hard question to answer. Uh, there are some general things that almost everybody winds up saying, like he was a, a Greek born in the Caucasus and uh, uh, spoke Russian, was uh, educated in a, a, the famous Kars military cathedral, which incidentally, according to certain people, is uh, where Stalin was educated also. Okay. Uh, but but he had a a very interesting youth, which was extremely important. He was living in what was a crossroads of cultures, where due to the millennia of trade and exchange of religions and so forth via the Silk Roads, it was exposed to a great many cultural influences as a youth, and he became fascinated with the idea that there had at some time in the past been an ancient knowledge that had uh, apparently been lost, even though some relics of it persisted. For example, he was quite interested in magic, what we would call magic, in, for example, uh, channeling uh, spirits from, from other places and times and sympathetic magic similar to voodoo. He speaks about this in, in his uh, autobiography, Meetings with Remarkable Men. And he uh, also became very interested in the sources of religion and religious tradition. Another really important influence was his father was a traditional bard uh, known as an Ashok, uh, who uh, had a, a day job as a, as a carpenter and, and also kept uh, sheep, but he was he had memorized vast uh, tales from the oral tradition, and one of the stories that the young Gurdjieff heard from his father, which made a great impression on him, turned out uh, to be the, the story of Gilgamesh, and this was before the documents were uncovered in in Iraq that. Uh, gave scholars access to the story of Gilgamesh. So when that, ha when that happened, uh, the young Gurdjieff realized that this knowledge had been passed down, this tale had been passed down orally for several thousand years and mm. received by him from his father. Uh, and it, I don't know if you know the story, but it's an, it's an esoteric story, a teaching story about a man who uh, searched for immortality and was told that he didn't deserve it, but that if he could do one simple little thing, uh, he could have it. And that simple thing was to stay awake for seven days. <laughs> well, needless to say, he went he went to sleep immediately, and he slept <laughs> for the whole seven days. <laughs> it, it, it seems to be the, the, the human condition, something right. of an epidemic. Uh, epidemic. Um, now... When we're talking about Mr. Gurdjieff, and um, I've been in the work not anywhere near as long as you have, but when I first approached the work, we you know people were calling it the work. I knew it as the fourth way, um, and you know some of the various uh, exponents of the teaching have called it the method or the system. What do all, why are there so many different terms for? this work and what do they mean for example when we talk about fourth way how how did mr gurdjieff present that 
Well, the, the reason there are different terms is there are different lineages, and just like sex in any religion, they like mm-hmm. to dis- differentiate each other from each other. Uh, the fourth way was a term that is from mainly from Uspensky's book, In Search of the Miraculous, which is considered kind of a standard introductory book on on the Gurdjieff teaching. And the idea is that there are three other ways, which he called the way of the the body, the way of the feelings, and the way of the mind. And he, he gave examples, fakirs, who do uh, rigorous uh, uh, penances with the body and uh, accomplish incredible feats of endurance, uh, develop a certain inner force in that way. And the way of feelings is is the monastic way, the way of monks who by devotion and cultivation of intense religious feeling uh, and submission to uh, of, of their ego to uh, authority of the head monk and other things such as the Jesus prayer, uh, all of which have this emotional this sacri- uh, character of an emotional sacrifice, they, they can also achieve something of great force. And then the way of the mind, which he characterized as the, the what yogis practice. And all of these are sort of caricatures, of course, because they all, all these different ways in, in reality involve all of the aspects. Mm-hmm. But the, the way of the yogi develops his consciousness by mental exercises and and uh, by pondering uh, a subtle theological and metaphysical questions and he also can develop um, but Gurdjieff wanted to say that his way was different and that it involved all of those fe- all of those functions simultaneously and this was his uh, important idea of the the three centers, the body, uh, the feelings, and the mind. And he, his idea is that normally people are only, only live in one of those centers, or perhaps at most two, but that a real man, a, a, full, a full, fully developed man, should be alive you know, with equal force in all three of those centers all the time. And this was what he wanted to show people how to develop this possibility. Mm, that's very interesting. Um, what uh, you, you mentioned that he traveled extensively and that he experienced a lot of uh, different cultures. What what kind of influences do you think that he had on his thoughts uh, on his the development of his system? Well, this is another question that everybody wants to ask, and for which there are no really satisfactory answers. Oh, uh, well, that's what we do he, here he, on this show. <laughs> yes. He, he, he went, according to his own stories, he went many places, uh, and some of those stories are probably fictional. Some of them are uh, are actual things he experienced. Others of them are fictionalized versions of the things he did. But literally, it's it's, it's proven quite impossible to track down places where he actually was in, but presumably in the Middle East, in Tibet, in in the mountains of the Hindu Kush, in Persia, in China, Egypt, um, many of these places he uh, speaks about in his in his own writings, and there's no reason to doubt that he he was there and encountered teachings and teachers there, and uh, attained quite a reputation. You you mentioned that to a certain extent he presents himself as a scoundrel and <laughs> he cer- he certainly does in in at least in this book meetings of the remarkable men but a, a scoundrel of a of a special kind <laughs> one has to say whose reasons for being sc- scoundrelish m- may have been quite different from those of most scoundrels uh, it, particularly he wanted to free people from uh, the emptiness of conventional morality, uh, among other things, and also the emptiness of conventional religion, and also of the common pursuit of money and power and sex and everything that people pursue, all of which are ultimately traps that uh, take uh, the put blinders on somebody and prevent them from developing outside of the sphere that, that they're 
and caught him. So one way of doing that is to shock people mm. by behaving in unconventional ways and, and making them see their own reactions to that and uh, perhaps having what we call cognitive dissonance about how this person whom they, everyone who knew him recognized him as extraordinary. Uh, yeah. Whether they liked him or not, some of them didn't, of course, but uh, how could such a man behave in such a way must have been a thought that occurred to many, many people. You know, I remember there's been a number of stories, uh, not so much scoundrel, but some of the bizarre behavior. There's a story about him being on a train with some of his, his people and uh, completely causing complete chaos on the train. There was one of him coming to America, and they, they pull into the port, and he throws his passport overboard, <laughs> and he ended up in Ellis Island. Uh, and it, it, he, he did this sort of thing, as Richard said, um, I think to to get people to cognitive dissonance, move out of that and see themselves, see how they're behaving. One of the things I want to loop back to is that Mr. Gurdjieff taught that humans are living in a state of waking sleep and he compared us to machines and, and uh, to, to being very automatic and sometimes um, if the machine is going on its own way it can actually operate pretty efficient, efficiently until something comes in that shakes things up and, and that mm -hmm. shock may cause a person to at least briefly hop out of that sleep although we tend to, to fall right back in. Yes. Well, as I was saying, people are trapped in, in all sorts of different things that that they take in as influences in their life or that are inculcated in them deliberately, say, by, or by parents and education. And yes, uh, sometimes, sometimes a shock, either great loss or illness, or on the other hand, a great triumph uh, in some field can can be so shocking that momentarily one is quite open. And prob probably many people have had that experience after suffering a great loss. Uh, uh, there's a period when you really see yourself more clearly and you see your life more clearly. Uh, and uh, perhaps perhaps many people make resolutions to, to change or under the influence of things like that. Uh, and they go join religion or something like that. But if, as, you, as you said, it only lasts for a time, and they go in a relatively short period of time. It's as if nothing ever really happened. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I remember one time Mr. Gurdjieff was teaching, um, and he spoke of us humans as spoiled automobiles. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. One of the things to, for me that uh, I've appreciated about this teaching is that it recognizes the idea of human damage. I have encountered a lot of spiritual teachings, religious teachings, uh, supposedly psychological teachings that say, okay, there's a problem here, you know about it, now go change. And right. it struck me, I remember one evening I was actually uh, meditating, I had, I had not read the bit about the spoiled automobiles yet, but, and I had this believe it or not, this kind of awaking vision of being in an automobile where I, I knew that the engine wasn't running and doing that thing where you, you know the engine shouldn't be running, uh, you know you're in a junker, but you turn that key in the ignition a few more times and just hope and hope and hope that something different's going to happen, mm -hmm. even though you're doing the exact same thing. Um, and that's what struck me, and I, I kind of just had this shock in me. Oh, that's kind of what I've been doing. And then, of course, I read that bit in Views from the Real World. Now, what Mr. Gurdjieff uh, brought in, in the fourth way or the work or the, or the system is a way for people who are not apprenticing to a fakir or a yogi or a monk or who aren't in a monastery, but it's a way for people to use everyday life uh, to to wake up, and uh, there are a variety of organizations uh, around the world that do this in in the Gurdjieff work. Um, Richard, people oftentimes ask, you know, what is that all about? How how does the work work to help people in their every use their everyday lives to wake up? 
Uh, right. Uh, I, I'd be a little careful about using the term to use life. One doesn't use life. Life is bigger than, than we are, but, but it's possible to live life. And the, the fact is that we don't, we only live, uh, an imaginary life, what we imagine about life, and uh, to to really live a moment of life is already an immense thing, and and to live a whole day or a whole week, this is this is quite something extraordinary. Uh, and 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 he did emphasize that it's a work that takes place in life, again to differentiate from other schools and teachings in which some sort of isolation from life is is uh, is done. Tibetan monks who shut them up cells up in cells or even our, our Christian monastics. Uh, uh, and and yes, life life is the is the setting in which one has to learn how to to work. Also, there are, as you as you know, meditation-like exercises and other practices which are um, what what we sometimes call special conditions, like the, the movements, the, the dances, which are some people call it sort of a halfway house between uh, between total innerness and life. And there, it's possible to practice more intensely. Uh, have a very intense inner work while doing a simple movement or doing a meditation. But the idea is ultimately to be able to do that in life itself. And this is very, very difficult. Uh, people find they have a good connection inside with certain energies and they say, okay, I'm going to go out and, uh, and do something, go to, go to the grocery store or something like that and maintain this. But, how long does it last? Uh, minutes or seconds even. <laughs> Some, something comes along and attracts the attention and stimulates a whole series of associations and, and one completely forgets what the plan was and just is the same old ordinary self. So, so that, but, but with practice, it becomes possible to stay longer in life. Yeah. And this, it, this is the secret of the work. Yeah. One thing that uh, it, it's been interesting uh, to some, maybe to some people, is that from the kind of from the beginning or very early on, uh, this this work was taught in groups. Uh, it yes. was not necessarily taught one on one, although there may have been that kind of instruction that took place. But it was taught in groups. People worked together in groups. Why is that? Well, uh, it, it's not true that he that all of his work was in groups. He had a lot of work uh, with individual people, uh, but there is the idea of that working with others is uh, a special a special condition that has unique advantages, uh, and uh, especially working with others who are also working, as we say, working on themselves. Uh, it makes one feel more responsible for one's own work to be around others who are working. Uh, uh, it makes you feel like not not being such a nasty person as one sometimes might otherwise be, uh, uh, which is you know has its has its benefits. Uh, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> sometimes, not always. <laughs> Um, but uh, and also the there are there's a kind of a sharing that takes place in in groups, sometimes verbal, but it definitely can also be nonverbal. Some sort of exchange of emanations or vibrations or or something like that that very much raises one's uh, horizon to to another level, another world, even sometimes. And. Uh, this, there are certain things that are possible in this way that just simply aren't uh, when you're in your own room. I, th I think that Mr. Gurdjieff spoke about the fact that 
you, know, you have people who want to wake up but can't do it on their own and in a group, particularly if they can find a guide or a teacher and then they, the group can commit together to working together to help keep each other awake. Yes. And, yeah, uh, yeah it, you know, it, it's something that I found, I, I'm speaking as an introvert, um, that was something that I had to adjust to. But as you pointed out, it's incredibly important in terms of accountability, uh, for one thing. But also, as you point out, the, the emanations there, you, you know, you're in a group, you don't necessarily choose who you're in that group with. And there be people who I might like or dislike according to my whims and, and I have to find a way to work with that. And that alone can be very helpful, I think. And um, maintaining some state of awakeness, although again, like anything, it can become habitual. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also very important to learn how to open to the people that you're with. For example, if somebody tells you in in more or less words, you're asleep right now, you have to listen. You Mm -hmm. have to know to take it in and and really ask yourself, are you is that true? Possibly and. you don't necessarily have to agree, but you you need to learn. We don't listen very well to the no. things that people say. Yeah, that must be very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. It, it is, but it, it's um, it's imp- it's uh, it's it's very important because if you if you're not willing to listen, you know you're hearing something, uh, but you're can be sleepwalking right through it. Mm-hmm. Well, you you translate it into your own language, and you go off on associations, and you're thinking about something entirely else, or you're waiting for a moment when you can insert your thought into this <laughs> conversation. Well, it's reaction, and there's a re- yeah. there's a, re- a reaction, a, often a defensive reaction, uh, that prevents any kind of work with what's just been offered. Now, it, it may be that the person is just, just messing with you or being a jerk, uh, but that alone is actually can be very useful because you can actually uh, observe yourself and, and how, in, in how you're responding to someone who's messing with you. But uh, you know, many times what somebody has to say, particularly in the work, uh, there's oftentimes some, some real truth to that. And that's something that I have to work on. And, and at the very least, they were willing to offer that to me. And uh, for that, you know, gratitude is in order. True. And sometimes even fools and scoundrels speak the truth. <laughs> I've noticed this frequently. <laughs> That'll do it for part one of our episode of The Gnosis of Gurdjieff with Richard Hodges. The next episode, we're going to talk about the development of the soul in Gurdjieff's system, how you don't actually start off life with a soul, but you get the chance to develop one, and how you have many eyes, many personalities that uh, you kind of of float around this um, nebulous thing we call a person. We also talk about some of the origins of where Gurdjieff's thought may have come from. And we also talk about the body and the essence and the personality and how those things kind of relate to each other. So you'll want to catch all of that coming up next week on part two of the Gnosis of Gurdjieff with Richard Hodges.